The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. We're going to be talking about uh, the book, um, I Hear You Paint Houses, and it's by Charles Brandt. And uh, thank you for joining us today, Charles. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So now, uh, this is exciting. I've heard that this book, uh, they've made it into a Netflix movie with uh, all these great actors and, and, and director and everything. Yeah, that must be pretty exciting. Oh, my God, is it exciting. It's an all-star cast. Would you like me to yeah. run it down? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, why not? Well, go. All right. To start with uh, a, a young fellow by the name of Marty Scorsese is going to be directing it. And uh, among the other youngsters in this movie are Bob De Niro. He's playing Frank the Irishman Sheeran. Uh, and Sheeran, as you may know if you've read my book, was the number one suspect in Hoffa's disappearance. And uh, I was a lawyer, and he was my client. And we ended up spending five years together on tape with him confessing many, many misdeeds to me, including his role in the murder of Jimmy Hoffa. And uh, De Niro is going to play Hoffa, uh, excuse me, De Niro is going to play Frank the Irishman Sheeran. Uh, Al Pacino is going to play Jimmy Hoffa. The mafia boss in charge of the hit was a man named Russell Buffalino. He was the most powerful mafia boss in America at the time, but he kept an extremely low profile. And so he's the mafia boss that most people never heard of. But you can Wikipedia him and find out just how strong he was. Anyway, um, his role is being played by Joe Pesci. Then... Uh, Harvey Keitel is in it as um, uh, as the mafia boss of Philly by the name of Angelo Bruno. Uh, Ray Romano from Everybody Loves Raymond is in it, and he plays the uh, the mouthpiece. Uh, Bill Buffalino, a lawyer, a lawyer for the Teamsters, uh, and, and on and on. The list just goes on. Anna Paquin, you remember her? Oh yeah, the actress. Yeah. She plays one of Frank Sheeran's daughters, Peggy Sheeran. Um, Welker White plays uh, uh, Jimmy Hoffa's wife. Uh, and uh, it's it's quite an all-star cast, as I said, and, and uh, quite authentic. They um, relied heavily on the book. They had me advising and meeting with them. They had me in a hotel in New York uh, for two months, and I would attend script meetings with De Niro, Scorsese, and the screenwriter Steve Zalian, who won the Oscar for Schindler's List. And so I was there to make sure that their, all their questions were answered. And uh, then they began filming. When the final screenplay came to me, I told them I had no notes for it. I was overjoyed. And they shortly, uh, a few days later, they began filming. They did most of their filming in New York City or the environs. And um, they assigned a, um, a researcher by the name of Mary Ann Bowers, a ter terrific gal, uh, to ask me questions from time to time. I would get a, two or three calls a week from her. Uh, sometimes every day I'd get a call from her. They'd be shooting a, a scene. And they'd want my uh, an answer to some aspect of that scene. Uh, it was quite fascinating because I was not, I could have been in New York and, um, and gone to the set every day, but I have a commitment to where I live in Sun Valley, Idaho. And so here I was 3,000 miles away uh, helping out on the set. <laughs> well, I finally did visit the set uh, at the toward the end, and um, what was really fun about that for me, they were filming in a in a town, uh, a New York City, uh, one of the outlining borough towns called um, Ridgewood, not Ridgewood, New Jersey, but Ridgewood, Brooklyn and Queens. It's on the Brooklyn Queens border, and uh, I was sitting in the director's chair, watching them film. 
and it was my hometown. I, I lived there till the sixth grade. <laughs> and so here I was back in Ridgewood after all these years. It was fabulous. Wow. That's, so anyway. that's pretty amazing. I, that'd be real exciting. Oh, my well, God. It's, a, it's unbelievable. Honor. In fact, the hotel they had me in was on 54th Street and, and, um, and Broadway. And when I would leave in the morning to go to Marty Scorsese's house in Midtown Manhattan uh, for a meeting, uh, and, and I'll say something about about the meeting process in a second, but uh, if I look to my left and look straight down uh, 54th Street for about five blocks, I would see this tall telephone company building that in 1960 I worked on. I was a timekeeper on that building. So here I had come full cycle from a $65 a week timekeeper on a construction project where I had to uh, walk out on the beams. Five stories below was my desk for 65 bucks, <laughs> And here I am. <laughs> Here I am on my way to meet with Marty Scorsese at his house. Unbelievable. Yeah. And Marty. Get to call him Marty. Wow. Oh, I do. And it's, <laughs> I know. And, it's, and and I didn't intend it. It's just that's what everyone else was calling him. You know? Yeah. So. No, that's great. <laughs> so that's his name. No, yeah. I'm, I'm happy for you. That's fantastic. Um, Thank you. Well, you know, good book. It, it's just everything's in it. Um, now, let's <laughs> let's start with the title. I really want to start with the title. I hear you paint houses. Sure. Now, I, I know what that is. I've been through the book and everything. But for the listeners that don't know, that should pick up the book, what is that title about? Well, it's, it, it is the first words that Jimmy Hoffa ever uttered to Frank the Irishman Sheeran. It was a job interview. Hoffa had just taken over as president of the Teamsters. It was around 1957. In fact, it was 1957. <laughs> and, and he contacted Russell Buffalino uh, in Pennsylvania for muscle. He, he wanted to get rid of certain enemies of his that he felt were going to hurt the labor movement by sowing dissent and disrupting solidarity. And so he wanted them eliminated. And Frank the Irishman was uh, a hitman for Russell. Well, Russell put Frank on the phone with with Hoffa. Hoffa was calling from Detroit, and they were in a, 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 a mafia hangout in Philly. Uh, and um, Russell said to Frank, say hi to your boss, Jimmy Hoffa. Hoffa got on the phone, or Frank got on the phone with Hoffa, and Hoffa uttered these words, I heard you paint houses. And those words mean, I heard you kill people. The paint is the blood that spatters on the, on the floor when you whack somebody. <laughs> and, uh, and Frank re- responded appropriately, I do my own carpentry work too, which means I get rid of the bodies myself. And so the next day, Frank was in Detroit, flown from Philly to Detroit, and began work for Hoffa, the same kind of work he had done for Russell Buffalino. And thereafter, he split his time between Russell in the Philadelphia area and Jimmy wherever he might be, even when he went to jail. And um, when... Hoffa disappeared, the um, case agent, the FBI agent in charge of the uh, investigation, he was a man named, um, uh, not that he's gone now, he's he's just no longer (laughs) doing that line of work anymore, but his name is Bob Garrity, and uh, he attended a book signing of mine and said, make this book out to Bob Garrity, and I said, how do I know that name? He said, I was the Hoffa case agent. I said, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> and, and he and I became buddies. And his first words to me were, we always liked Sharon Ford. The Hoffa kids, uh, Jimmy had a son and a daughter. Uh, the Hoffa kids thought the, the sun rose and set on, um, on Frank Sheeran. And that's how they do it. it. You know, they get somebody that can get close enough to do the hit, they get somebody who can get close enough to the victim. And in this case, uh, Frank was um, was being mentored over the years in, in union work by Hoffa. 
at the same time, he was being mentored uh, in mafia work uh, by Russell Buffalino. And uh, it wasn't just killing Hoffa that they made him do. And, and uh, Frank said to me, uh, if I ever said no to Russell uh, on this matter, Jimmy would have been just as dead and I'd have gone to Australia with him, mean gone down under another slang expression I learned from Frank, uh, been killed right along with him. So Frank did it. Uh, and the way you read it in the book and the setup, it, not only didn't he have any choice, but they were watching his every move to make sure that he did it and that he didn't tip Hoffa off and that he lured Hoffa to a house in uh, Detroit, which Frank took me to. He remembered the house, remembered exactly where it was. And uh, I took him out to Detroit from Philly in style. I rented a Cadillac and put him in it. <laughs> and off, off we went to uh, Detroit and found that house. Since right after we found it, we didn't go in it. Uh, and in fact, he couldn't. He, his head was down. But uh, I didn't want... Uh, he had described the house to me, and I wanted it to be discovered by others as exactly as he described it to me, the interior. And that's exactly what was found. A Fox News team under the uh, reporter by the name of Eric Sean went out there, gained entrance through uh, you know, legitimately through the then owner, uh, a man who's, who's uh, passed away since by the name of Rick Wilson. And, uh, they got in there, uh, and then they, they flew me out to Detroit and, and interviewed me and, and let me in that house. And it was precisely as, as Frank had described it. And, uh, in a perfect place to kill somebody. And uh, the body was disposed of at Bagnasco's funeral parlor in Detroit. Uh, it cremated. How, how do you so, how, how do you think um, Frankie the Irishman felt about having to kill Hoffa? It it ruined it, everything about him. Changed. He he was a drinker, but he became uh, absolutely absorbed by alcohol. And believe it or not. The hardest part for him was when Russell told him he had to call Mrs. Hoffa and assure her that Jimmy would turn up, that he, he, this was okay. A prior mafia boss by the name of Joe Bananas, uh, Bill Bana Joe Banano, known yes, as Joe Joseph Bananas. Bonanno, mm -hmm. a man of yeah. honor. A man of honor, exactly. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, who was that? Gay Police wrote that book. The wonderful Gay Police. Anyway, uh, um, Frank had to call Mrs. Hoffa and tell her that, uh, just like Joe Bananas turned up, um, and, and Joe Bananas turned up like 10 months after he had been abducted, uh, by the, the Mafia Commission had felt that Banana needed a lesson. He didn't need to be killed, but he needed a lesson. And so they picked him up. They took him to uh, a place in, in Arizona. Uh, he was their captive for 10 months. And then uh, an agreement was made that he would stay in Arizona, would not return to New York City, would not seek to regain his position on the on the commission, the, the governing body of the mafia, and uh, and would share certain profits that he had been hoarding. And so Frank made that call to Mrs. Hoffa, and it was the worst moment of his life, as he expressed it to me. You know, he was a, he was a part of that family. Mrs. Hoffa loved him. He loved her. And here he had to call her up and lie to her. And his words to me were, what kind of man does that? What can you say? You know, mm, <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, one of the techniques, oh, by the way, um, not that it's a no by the way, but uh, my field was uh, interrogation and cross-examination as a trial lawyer and before that as the chief deputy attorney general of the state of Delaware, where I personally was involved in uh, over 50 homicides. And I taught interrogation to cops. 
I taught cross-examination to other trial lawyers. And so from time to time, I had to use my techniques on Frank. And one of the, of the techniques that an interrogator does to loosen the lip of the murderer is to blame the victim, that the victim had it coming. And that takes some of the guilt off the um, your subject that you're interrogating. And so I, and it was true uh, uh, in this case, uh, Hoffa helped get himself killed. He just couldn't control the threats he was making against organized crime. He was threatening to get get back to Union, take it back, and um, get his hands on the on the records, and demonstrate that under the previous president Frank Fitzsimmons, the mafia had infiltrated uh, the Teamsters Union. And you don't talk like that. You don't talk like that about these people, these very powerful people. In fact, when uh, Frank tried to warn him, uh, Hoffa's response was, they wouldn't dare. When Frank Mm. said to him, you know, Russell told me to tell you what it is, which means what it is means you're going to be killed. And uh, and Frank's reply, I mean, um, Hoffa's reply was, they wouldn't dare. Well, that's arrogance on his part. Yeah, in talking that way... um, now they have to make a point. He was asking for it, so to speak, you know. And I and I played that angle with Frank. The other angle I played with Frank was that Frank was raised a very strict Catholic. Uh, his father had studied five years for the priesthood. He didn't finish, but he had studied for five years. And then his mother went to Mass every single morning, early Mass of his life. And I had been raised a Catholic as well, and so I used that on Frank in our uh, discussions. I talked uh, religion with him, and um, and uh, it it kept him talking on tape. By the way, all of it's on tape, and the FBI has my tapes. <laughs> I'm proud to say they know it's all true. They, but because there are still two suspects from the original uh, conspiratorial gang that did this. Uh, a man uh, named Tommy Andretta, who lives in Las Vegas, and a man named Chucky O'Brien is not really his name. His name is Pagano, his last name. He was Italian, but he lives in Boca Raton, Florida. And as long as the the case is an active case, the FBI won't comment on it. But don't worry about it. <laughs> they, they, now, now, when, when you that, when you say they, though, uh, that, that, that what did you say, sir? When, when you say that you played certain angles, though, um, let, let's go back to the Catholicism. Um, sure. Uh, I, just a curiosity uh, uh, for me, because, you know, what I know of, of the mob and the mob lifestyle, they were very active in their churches, and they gave large amounts of money to their churches. Um, yeah, many uh, did. Many uh, did. Yeah, uh, now I, I'm choosing my words very carefully. But would you say that maybe their heavy involvement in the church, was that a cover-up? Like, like he wouldn't dare do something like that. He's a really good Catholic. Or was that kind of a self-resolution? Like, let me balance my, my karmic <laughs> scales here because I'm doing all these, you know, things over here. Let me give heavily to the church so that maybe I can kind of resolve this with myself. Well, for sure, Frank was uh, Frank the Irishman Sheeran. Uh, he had had a, a sense of morality uh, inside him from his early training in the, in that religion. He went to all all Catholic schools, uh, and one day he was moved um, to return to his faith when he was in jail. He was at the Springfield Prison Hospital in Missouri, and Russell Buffalino happened to be there at the same time. Uh, Russell was nearing the end of his life, and uh, he had an 11-year sentence, and he was serving it most of it at the prison hospital, and then they allowed him to serve the rest of it uh, in a not in in his home, in a motel that he owned near his home, uh, Howard Johnson's Hotel in Pennsylvania. Well, one day, uh, by the bocce court, you know what bocce is? Uh, 
uh, enlighten me. Well, it's an Italian game played with balls, and it's like bowling. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Okay, I'm and sorry. On court. And uh, the other thing that I played was I'm Italian. And, uh, my last name isn't. My father uh, was not, but he was um, a part of the, the large Italian family. He had, um, you know, the good old melting pot. Well, my father melted into the Italian family <laughs> so that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was raised Italian. My my mother had nine brothers and sisters, and uh, my grandparents had a little farm in Staten Island. My my grandfather had a horse and wagon, and and peddled the, the produce that he grew, and and that's how I was raised myself. And Frank uh, spent a lot of time in Italy during World War II. He also lived in Italian neighborhoods in Philly, and he got to speak fluent Italian. And then he was, um, he just fit right in with these Italians. Well, one day at um, Springfield Hospital, Frank was near the bocce court <laughs> watching the bocce game. And all of a sudden along comes um, Russell in a wheelchair. And he's being wheeled up, up into the chapel. And Frank laughs like, you know, what, what's, what are you doing going to chapel? And Russell said to him, don't laugh, my Irish friend. When you get to be my age, uh, you'll see that there's more to, to this life than, than we know. And Russell was the first one to have what is known in Catholicism as a deathbed conversion. As you're nearing the end of your life, you, you convert. And, and the, the, another one Frank had was the, uh, the foxhole conversion. He had that during the war. He spent 411 combat days when the average was 80. He was in the entire war from start to finish in the in Europe. And, hey, uh, I, I've he, figured what what do they say? There's not a such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. <laughs> correct. And he had a foxhole conversion. He said, "We prayed. We prayed. We would we would give up uh, every vice. You know, <laughs> you, could, mm. you could imagine. You know." And, 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 uh, until the bullets stop flying. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. now, now fast forwarding, you know, it, it's always been a mystery to me. I, you know, I've read a lot about Hoffa, and and you know, everybody is very familiar, you know, with well, Hoffa is under the home plate at such and such stadium, and and this and that. But what did Hoffa actually do to cross the mob? To cross the mob, did you say? Yes, sir. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me quickly address uh, the uh, giant stadium. <laughs> uh, that That is a well-known myth that he was buried in giant stadium. Well, Bob Garrity told me that they actually checked that with uh, with the device that... Um, uh, Ground a, a radar, radar kind of... Yeah, a radar kind of device. And the reason they checked it is that Russell Buffalino, who owned a piece of an awful lot of businesses, owned a piece of the architectural firm that built Giant Stadium. Mm -hmm. And so they had to check it. Of course, they found nothing, but they had to check it. Well, I'm surprised uh, Rivaldo what, didn't do a big special on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they didn't let uh, reporters near there while they were doing it, but they did it. Anyway, um, you asked what did Hoffa do? Uh, a couple of things. The first thing was that um, uh, when he was in prison, Hoffa got uh, 11 years' worth of sentences. And when he went to prison, he was still, because of the, of the uh, crimes for which he was convicted, he was still entitled to receive his lump sum pension of uh, a million and a half. Jeez. While at the same time, a prominent uh, mafioso in New York, a capo in the Genovese family, Tony Provenzano, a.k.a. Tony Pro, was not allowed to get his pension. He went to jail with Hoffa, Lewisburg Prison. It's the jail that's depicted in the movie uh, Goodfellas. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, but Crow was not allowed to get his his pension because of the nature of the crimes he was convicted of. 
for extortion, you don't get <laughs> you don't get your pension. Well, for geez, but, a, but a million and a half, Al, we're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, that was. I think Jimmy's was th- was Jimmy's was more than that. A million and a half was Tony Pro's. I don't remember what Jimmy's was. So Pro wanted Jimmy to pull strings and get him his million and a half, and Jimmy refused to do it. They ended up uh, bickering in prison, and Jimmy, uh, always outspoken, said, "It's it's it's people like you that have got got me in trouble in the first place." What are you talking about, people like me? What kind of what kind of disrespect is that? The two of them ended up having a fist fight in prison. From that moment on, Tony Pro, who had been a Hoffa ally, he was actually a, a vice president of the Teamsters, strong for Hoffa. From that point, he had made a tremendous enemy out of Tony Pro, and therefore out of the Genovese family and therefore out of the commission because the Genovese family was on the uh, the ruling body of the of the mafia and little by little they pecked away at at um, at Hoffa until finally Russell gave in Russell Buffalino mm-hmm. and agreed to to get rid of Hoffa and he planned it from start to finish planned it to take an hour i don't want to give uh, the the people the the notion that this book is like more like a newspaper headline you know it's a biography it's all about frank the irishman sheeran from the cradle to the grave in fact um my last confession that i got from him was in lankano hospital uh and this one was on video all the others were on audio tape and he had agreed to do one on videotape for me and um and that was his final confession. And he then uh, chose to kill himself by not eating. And six weeks li- later, he was dead. Uh, what a way to go. Yeah. Apparently, it's not that uncommon in nursing homes. He was he was in a nursing home by then. But as, as a means to, uh, to, to end it all. The man who had chosen the life expectancy of 25 to 30 people... And that, he confessed 25 to 30 hits to me, including Crazy Joey Gallo, which is a, a more famous in New York than it probably is in Seattle, but uh, you could look him up. Crazy Joey Gallo was one crazy dude, and uh, Frank killed him at Umberto's Clam House in uh, New York City's Little Italy area. Uh, what's interesting about that is in the book, there's a photograph a table full of beer bottles, and at the head of the table is Frank Sheeran and me. And um, I'm moving toward Frank Sheeran, obviously holding something under the table. That was my tape recorder. Frank had just confessed at that moment to killing uh, Crazy Joey Gallo. Well, we spent more time on that. You know, I spent a lot of time with Frank, and we spent uh, I had five years. I had him to myself for five years. And so I was able to use my skills to make sure I was getting the truth out of him. And when he said that he had killed uh, Gallo, I said, now that can't be, because the, the story out there on the street is that three Italians burst into uh, Umberto's and killed Gallo. And it was not a lone six-foot-four-inch, 220-pound Irishman, the toughest guy you'll ever meet. It was three Italians, and they made two movies. Um, on Everybody Loves Raymond, there's the father. I can't think of his... Uh, boy, Ed As- is it Ed Asner? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you got uh, he me. Starred <laughs> as, he starred as Crazy Joey in one of the movies, and I forget who starred in the other. There were two movies, and, and in both of them, they had three Italian men burst into Umberto's and kill him. Plus, in an, in about uh, uh, eight eight to ten books, I I had to read them all. You know, uh, the same the same version was that uh, uh, three Italian gunmen burst in and killed Gallo. And when my book came out, 
a Nash, the national assignment editor at the time for the New York Times, uh, saw the book, saw the photograph in the book of Frank Sheeran, and she said, I was there that night when it happened. There was no three gunmen. There was only one, and it was this man in that picture. So uh, th- then there were others that came forward. Um, uh, somebody found an old newspaper article of the then the then uh, chief of detectives Al Seedman in New York City uh, came out and announced to the um, assembled newspaper reporters that all this was the work of a lone gunman. So. Anyway, if anybody ever needed to know whether Frank was telling the truth or not, just look at that yellow story in the book. Hmm. What about um, his, um, he claimed to have uh, knowledge about the uh, JFK assassination. Yep, I was getting, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, there's, a, there's a story here that I think you'll be interested in. Uh, and if you read an earlier version of the book, it doesn't have this story in it. Uh, the, the latest version of the book has a 57-page conclusion chapter that has this story in it, and you'll you'll hear why I didn't put it in it, and you won't you won't <laughs> blame me for that. The very fir- I got Frank out of jail in in 1991. That was when I first began to have a have contact with him. And he said to me that he had read, I had written a book on interrogation called The Right to Remain Silent, St. Martin's Press. It did, did very well. And it came out when he was in prison. He, he was serving a 32 year sentence. And I got him out on medical grounds. Uh, he had severe spinal stenosis and he needed surgery. And when I got him out, he took me to lunch. Well, he took my, my whole office to lunch. Uh, along with uh, his his crowd of eight guys named Rocco sitting at a at a mafia hangout in Senti's, <laughs> and after the lunch he took me aside, and he said that I'm tired of being written about in all the books on Hopper. They all say I, I had something to do with Jimmy's disappearance. I read your book when I in jail, and I want you to write a book for me that proves that I didn't have anything to do with Hoppe, with Hoppe's disappearance. Well, in my field of interrogation, when somebody says that to you and uses those words and, and certain inflections, you get an immediate hunch that this guy has something he wants to get off his mind, off his chest. And it turned out he did. He, he hated himself for having to kill Hoffa. And uh, so I met with him. And a a few days later, I went to his apartment in Springfield, Pennsylvania, and began allowing him to get it off his chest. We spent five hours together in that first meeting. And one of the techniques you use as an interrogator is you want the subject to keep talking. You don't want them to stop and start considering, gee, what did I just say, you know? And so if there's a lull, you want to egg, egg it on. You don't care if he talks about the color of his date's prom dress when he went to the prom. <laughs> you just want words to come out of his mouth, and you know and you have faith that If enough words come out of his mouth, the truth has its own way of coming out. So at one point, there was a lull. And I didn't want that lull. And so I said to him, Frank, uh, how come um, there were so many people involved in this? You gave me eight names. Uh, Tony Giacalone, Tommy Andretta, Steve Andretta, Chucky O'Brien, Tony Provenzano, Russell Buffalino, um, I'm missing two. Oh, Sal Bergoglio, uh, missing one more. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I said them out loud to him. You know, you gave me these names. Why so many? 
Now, I knew the answer to that. I knew that there was more than one answer to that. But I knew the answer, but I just wanted him talking. And he said, well, that way, if you go bad, meaning if you turn state's evidence someday and become a cooperating witness for the FBI, if you go bad, that way you only know what you did. You don't know what the others did before you and the others did after you. Right. Keep everything in compartments, compartmentalize. Yeah. Compartmentalize. So I said, yeah. And I had seen a movie years earlier, uh, uh, many years earlier. I was 19 when I'd seen the movie. I saw it in Atlantic City, New Jersey. There, there was a, uh, an attraction called the Steel Pier in Atlantic City. And us guys from New York City would take the bus over to Atlantic City for the day. And one of the things they had was a, a movie theater that you didn't have to pay to, to go into. And they would play uh, movies that opened nowhere. And there was a movie that I saw where a, a hitman is, takes the train to New York from Cleveland to kill a mafioso in Cleveland. And when the hitman goes to collect his money, He's rubbed out. Oh, no. The name, of, the name of the movie is Blast of Silence. So I said to Frank, you know, it's, it seems to me also that if you did this by yourself, you stand a good chance of being killed yourself. And Frank said, well, you, you'd have to be out of your mind to do this by yourself. They're not going to have a massacre. But the lone cowboy that is disposable, and they will dispose of a lone cowboy. And I said very innocently, just to keep the dialogue going, you mean like uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, the lone cowboy. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Frank began to listen and began to stare and began to turn to granite. And I realized I was on to something. And I moved in closer. And I said to him, he was sitting on a lazy boy. I moved in closer and I said that um, clearly it was, it was Jack Ruby's job to get rid of Oswald after the assassination. He was supposed to get rid of him on the street. And, and the more I'm talking, the scareder, this giant of a man, fearless man, began to look. And with his right hand, he began to kind of wave me away. This, it was on the ed edge of the lazy boy. And he's waving me away. He can't even come up with words. And I'm going on. That there's a lot worse in this world than facing a judge for killing Oswald. If you were supposed to get rid of him on the street and, and, and Ruby had cops and you're supposed to use your cops to get rid of him on the street and you don't, you'll be tortured to death, Chicago style. And finally, he utters these words. I'm not going anywhere near Dallas. Oh. Jesus Christ, thought I. <laughs> Neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> not with what you know you now. Know, I, well, not and certainly not, and not at that moment. You know, I was willing to risk it to to find out what happened to Hoffa. But are you kidding me? And and I knew that the from my work as a prosecuting attorney and a homicide investigator, I knew that these these bad guys uh, taped each other. They they uh, wiretapped each other. And so, for all I knew, that room was bugged. And as soon as, he, as soon as those words sunk in, and he's staring at me with these eyes of his, I quickly changed the subject. And, and, and I said, so then, in other words, uh, they used so many men uh, because it was like an assembly line. 
In other words, you only knew what you did. Is that what you're saying, Frank? And he said, that's right. So I knew it was time for me to get the hell out of there. I said, well, I think we're done for now. I'm going to type up uh, these notes. Yeah, I wasn't making notes, but I'm going to type up something on this, what they call a treatment, and I'll show it to you. Well, I, I typed it up. And, I, and he had given me 80% of what happened to Hoffa. He did not admit that he pulled the trigger. But, the, but at that time, nobody even knew there was a gun involved. You know, Nobody knew how he, was, he, how he was killed, except I knew at that moment, you know. Yeah, well, so I typed it. Go ahead. Well, well when, when it comes to Hoffa, have they ever closed the case? Do, do we know what? No, no, no. They, they can't close it because... Uh, there are two of the original members of the uh, uh, of the conspiracy that are still alive. Tommy Andretta lives in uh, Las Vegas, and Chucky O'Brien lives in uh, Boca Raton, Florida. So they haven't closed the case, but they have subpoenaed my tapes, and they they turned a um, when Russell Buffalino uh, died. Uh, his job as boss of the Buffalino family was taken over by a man named Billy D'Elia, who, by the way, didn't like me uh, during that five years I spent with Frank. Yeah, well, you're and, asking uh, too many questions. <laughs> that, that's just the model. Well, no, they, he didn't. No, we, he, uh, Frank told them that I was writing a book that clearing him. So that that's what they were being led to believe. I don't know that Billy D'Elia ever really believed it. But in the meantime, I was getting serial confessions from from Frank. So anyway, get, getting back to the uh, to the um, uh, JFK matter, uh, I typed up what he told me. Eighty percent of what happened to Hoffa, I named the names, but did not um, include anything about JFK. Frank read it, and he turned to stone again, and he said, you can't use this. These people are still alive. Russell was still alive then. Uh, all of them were still alive, Tony Jocalone. And uh, he said, you can't use this. I'm taking it. Well, he took it, but, of course, I, it was a, a copy that I had. of. Uh, uh, in, it, this was 1991, and believe it or not, we had... <laughs> We had computers then, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know I had I had to type on a computer, so he took that that one from me, and I said, well Frank, if you change your mind about any of this or any of these people die and you you want to talk to me some more, you know you know where to find me, and that ended everything for eight years. Eight years later, his daughter. Dolores took him to uh, for a Catholic ritual of absolution, a confession. He, she took him to Monsignor Heldesor of St. Dorothy's Church in uh, Springfield, Pennsylvania, and uh, he confessed to the priest. You don't have to confess in detail you, uh, to get absolution. And after that, he called me up and wanted to continue our where we left off eight years before. And he wanted to, to uh, do more confessing. He ended up confessing to three priests. In fact, in the movie, they have they have used a real Catholic priest, uh, a Father Jonathan from the Bronx, and the the real ritual. And Father Jonathan said to me that uh, when you confess three times to the same to three different priests to the same crimes, you got remorse. You, you're feeling remorse. So that was um, that was where we left uh, JFK. But when he returned to me eight and a half years later, I pressed him on the JFK, and I got some interesting stuff that's in the book. That's why I say this book is not just a uh, a one shot headline of what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. This is a a book about a a very interesting man. And a very sad man, 
at the end of his life. Did I mention I was a pallbearer at his funeral? No. And he had a, yeah, I was a pallbearer at his funeral, and he had a green, he had bought himself a green casket for the Irish. Mm. So. Hmm. And right now, the, the, the movie, the book is called I Heard You Paint Houses. The movie, uh, financed by Netflix, uh, it'll open in theaters, but uh, very likely it will open in theaters and then go to streaming it with Netflix. But um, they haven't decided on whether they continue to call it The Irishman or go back to uh, I Heard You Paint Houses, which is what... Uh, Bob De Niro said in an article in, um, in an interview for CNN that he wanted to, he and Marty wanted to return to the original book title from the Irishman to I Heard You Paint Houses. I, I think it's more catchy. I Hear You Paint Houses. You know, it, it lends to question, you know, what are they talking about? I need to watch this to find out. The Irishman, ah, you know. Well, I, you start, I like You start that. thinking That's of Mark I... Wahlberg. That's how I feel. That's how my wife feels. <laughs> my kids feel. We all we all hope they they settle in on. I heard you paint houses. Hmm. So now, in your book, you cover more of his younger age too, don't you? Yeah, I, I take him from the cradle to the grave practically. He had a very rough childhood. His father was kind of a brutal man. His father was an amateur boxer and a steel worker in Philly. He's uh, one of those men that climb up there and uh, position the beams into place, you know. Uh, not a long life expectancy for a lot of those men, but uh, but he was a drinker and a tough guy. And Frank was the oldest of three children. He had a, uh, a sister and a kid brother. And Frank was the one that bore the brunt of, of his father's uh, abuse. And if Frank did something wrong at school, the father made Frank put the gloves on, and uh, he was not allowed to hit back, but he could defend himself. So Frank, uh, you know, learned how to defend himself, at least. And he said that to me, you know, whatever I want to say about my father, he certainly prepared me for the life that I later have and prepared me for the war. I mentioned earlier Frank was in 411 combat days. I didn't mention including Anzio, four months under constant heavy bombardment at Anzio, a crazy period in America's uh, past, the way that was handled by the generals. And he was there for it. He, he helped liberate uh, the concentration camp, Dachau, at Dachau, and also the concentration camp in the Hartz Mountains. Hmm. So now Quite a lot of experience. Do you have a website and that's or something? Uh, unfortunately, I don't. My website uh -oh. went down and we're in the process of trying to get it back up. But um, my publisher has a website, Steerforth Press. Okay. And so we'll, we'll post that up with, with the book as well. It's um, something that's really important oh. so people can just one click and buy it. Yeah, they can get it on Amazon easily. Yeah. Um, again, one click and buy it. I, I wanted to also um, say something about Billy D'Elia. Okay. As the last boss of the, um, of the Buffalino crime family. As you know and, you, and your followers may know, the, the mafia took a big hit on, uh, by Rudy Giuliani in, uh, in the 1980s in New York. And essentially, they were put out of business, a slow death, little by little by little by little, till there really was no more commission. Uh, and uh, I like how you and, put that. And um, Billy D'Elia became the boss, succeeded Buffalino when Buffalino died. But by the time Billy became boss, things were falling apart. And Billy, while boss, was arrested for money laundering, uh, Costa Rican drug money, drug dealers. Um, Billy had two investment bankers that he used, J. 
to launder that money. And the two investment bankers decided to turn state's evidence against and save themselves and go against, testify against Billy. Well, Billy immediately put out a hit on them. And the guy he gave the hit to kill these two investment bankers had already become an FBI informant and a, and a FBI um, a cooperator. And so he was wired. And here's Billy giving instructions to kill Frank Pablico and another guy. I don't remember the other guy's name. And it's all being wired. It's all being tape recorded by the FBI. So now they arrest Billy for conspiracy to to commit murder, conspiracy to kill two government witnesses. In addition to the money laundering, he's going to go away forever. And instead, he decides to become a cooperating witness. And so he joins the FBI, and they come, they go to, uh, to the prison to meet with him. And the first question they ask him is, what happened to Hoffa? And he said, read that book. That's what happened to Hoffa. He had given a copy of the book to Frank Pablico, the man whose name I mentioned earlier, the investment banker. When the book first came out, he had given a copy to Frank Pablico, and he autographed it. Sometimes you can believe everything you read. <laughs> So it's a, t a testimonial. And, yeah, and and Frank Pablico told me that story. He also told the FBI that story, but he told me that story. And uh, that is now a blurb on the book, courtesy Billy D'Elia, wow. former boss of the Buffalino crime family. Sometimes you can believe everything you read. I got another blurb from an interesting man who's an actor and a, uh, a musician. He's in Bruce Springsteen's uh, East Street Band. His name is uh, Steve Van Zant. He also stars, he starred on The um, Sopranos, oh, and yeah. he also stars in a, in a TV show called Lil Lily Hammer about a mafioso who goes to Lily Hammer, Norway, to live <laughs> and, and <laughs> try to escape from his past life. Well, anyway, he's in the movie. And I met him at the rap party, uh, and uh, he said, you wrote that book? I said, that's right. He said, that is by far the best mafia book I ever read, and I read them all. I said, Steve, can I quote you on that, on the book jacket? He said, you sure can. <laughs> so that also appears on the book jacket. These were, were later, later on quotes. There were some initial quotes that were fabulous to begin with. Um, you know, uh, a, 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 man, a professor, Arthur Sloan, a professor of labor law, who read the book and unsolicited wrote me a letter telling me, you have solved the Hoffa mystery. You remember a, 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 um, a, a fellow who had, uh, he was a medical examiner of the city of New York, and he had a TV show on HBO called Autopsy. Oh, yeah. And um, he showed... Bodden. Yeah, Michael Bodden. Ma Michael Bodden. Michael Bodden. Same thing. He gave me the same quote that uh, you have solved the Hoffa mystery. This was early on when the book came out in 2004, but it takes a while. You know, we had had so many bad Hoffa books and so many uh, ridiculous stories like Giant Stadium, you know, yeah. that it took a while for it to catch on. And now it's on forever. You know, once once this is the book, that brought together uh, Scorsese and De Niro, brought them back together along with Pesci uh, after a, a nine years that they didn't make a movie together. And then to add Al Pacino to it and all the rest of them, it's quite something. And they've been a part of it because normally the writer of the book that the, that the movie is adapted from has no role. Once they buy the rights, they own the rights, and they don't want any monkey business. They don't want any advice from anyone. 
They know what they're doing. They're artists with, with their own vision. Well, after a couple of meetings with me, they were comfortable that I wasn't that kind of guy. I, you know, I wasn't, I was not in their line of work, nor did I want to be. <laughs> so, uh, I wrote about the mafia. I've had, uh, four books published and, uh, three of them were about the mafia. Uh, you, you remember the movie Donnie Brasco or the book Donnie Brasco? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Joe Fastone is the real Donnie Bresco. He infiltrated the Bonanno family for six years and uh, risking his life every moment of those six years. And he had written the book, uh, Donnie Bresco, My Life Undercover. And he had more material that he didn't use in the first book because those that material were cases that were still active, like I mentioned earlier, uh, with respect to uh, I Heard You Paint Houses and um, why the Hoffa case has not been closed. Well, the, some of the Donnie Brasco work had not been closed. Well, finally, when it was closed and the people went to jail and whatever, he had more material, and he, he, he loved... Uh, I heard, in fact, he gave me a quote for the book, I Heard You Paint Houses. <laughs> he said, Charlie, if those uh, mafia guys you were rubbing up against had any idea what Sheeran was confessing to you on a regular basis, you'd have both been promptly whacked. And that's in the uh, mm. in the book now uh, as a blurb. Anyway, he wanted to write a book uh, with the unused material, and I wrote it called uh, Donnie Brasco Unfinished Business. And then he introduced me to the uh, uh, the supervisory special agent of the New York office of the FBI who brought down the commission the, in the Mafia Commission case, working under Rudy Giuliani. And I did a book with him, Linda Vecchio, called We're Going to Win This Thing. So I've become a bit of a mafia expert, you know, <laughs> mostly from Frank. You know, yeah. Frank was my it's Pretty teacher. amazing. And when Frank, would say, when Frank would say to me, you can't write that, what I just told you, you can't write that. Those people are still alive. And even though what I told you was about Russell and Russell's dead, these people were in that with Russell. And, and they got to figure if I would talk that way about Russell as close as Russell and I were, what did I say about them? So you can't use that. There was a, a, a lot of material that only through the passage of time and other people dying or going to jail. You ever heard of Joey the Clown Lombardo, the head of the Chicago outfit? No, I can't say that I have. Well, you you could look him up. He was the he was the boss, is the last boss in Chicago, and he ultimately went to jail. But he used to call Frank regularly. I'd be sitting with Frank in his apartment, and and Joey would call, and they would talk talk their kind of talk, you know, right in front of me. <laughs> and I never mentioned that, you know, yeah. until the latest version of the book with with uh, Joey in prison. And now, you know, Billy D'Elia having turned state's evidence, I was no longer as concerned about them. And maybe I should still be, but I, you know. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you, Charles, it's been an amazing, amazing conversation. Really enjoy it. Your book is I Hear You Paint Houses. You. And our guest has been Charles Moran. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.